Hi, I'm Andrew Chen, Tech Lead for the vSphere Integrated Containers Appliance. Today I'll demonstrate the installation of the Vic Appliance version 131. I have downloaded the OVA for the Vic Appliance and will start its deployment using the Flex based vSphere web client. The HTML5 client and the legacy Windows client are not supported for initial installation. You may later use the HTML5 client with the Vic plugin to manage your vSphere integrated containers virtual container hosts. To deploy, I select the OVA, provide a VM name and data center or folder, and select the compute resource where the appliance will be run. I accept the license and select a data store. The Vic appliance requires a minimum of 80 gigabytes of storage, 20 gigabytes each for the system disk, logs, database, and application storage. The biggest consumer of storage on the Vic appliance is the container registry. If you plan to store more than 20 gigabytes of container images, the size of this disk can be increased. The other disks can also be resized according to your usage. Another consideration when selecting the data store is for future upgrades of the Vic appliance. The upgrade process requires deployment of the new Vic appliance, so the data store needs to be able to accommodate both the old appliance and the new appliance during the upgrade process. A future video will demonstrate the entire upgrade process. Next, select a network. The Vic appliance has one network interface. This interface is used for both management and client interaction. The appliance needs to be able to communicate with the vCenter server and the PSC for management functionality. The administrator also initializes the appliance, as we will see later in this demo, through a web interface on the appliance. For client usage, users of the container registry and container management portal access these services that are running on the appliance. Additionally, the appliance must be reachable by container hosts that wish to use the container registry. During the customization step, we can configure the settings for the appliance. For a basic install, you may accept the defaults for all values and only provide a root password for the appliance. By default, the appliance uses DHCP to obtain network configuration and auto-generates a self-signed TLS certificate. Also note that SSH is enabled by default as this is used for debugging and when upgrading the appliance in the future. To SSH to the appliance, use the username root and the root password that you set in this screen. Later updates to the root password must be made from within the operating system by SSHing into the appliance. For this demo, I will go over the available deployment options and use a custom TLS certificate. To use a static IP address, provide the IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, DNS servers, domain search path, and fully qualified domain name of the appliance here. If these fields are left blank, DHCP will be used. For the container registry, you may configure the port that the registry and notary listen on. For the management portal, you may configure the port that the management portal listens on and provide a custom TLS certificate by providing the certificate, key, and CA cert. This certificate will also be used for the registry. I have generated a CA, private key, and certificate here. Paste the PEM encoded values into the appropriate fields. Note that the private key must be in PKCS8 format. We can see that I have generated a PKCS1 format key, so I will convert it to PKCS8 before using it here. The OpenSSL command to convert to PKCS8 format can be seen at the top of the window here. This command can also be found in the VIC documentation under Certificate Reference. Note that the value you paste for the certificate in section 4.2 will be presented to clients as is. If your TLS certificate requires an intermediate CA, 
you should concatenate the one or more CA certs with the server certificate to create the certificate chain before pasting it in section 4.2. For the file server, which displays the initialization and getting started page, you may configure the port and provide a custom TLS certificate. I will use the same certificate as I used for the management portal. Finally, example users are created in the platform services controller during the appliance deployment. This allows for easy testing of the different personas that can access the container management portal and container registry. You may uncheck the box to skip the creation of these example users. Review the configuration and click finish to start deployment. The speed of your deployment will vary depending on your vSphere environment and network conditions. Once the deployment is complete, we power on the appliance and wait for it to receive an IP address. Once we get the IP address, we can see that the appliance is starting up by going to that IP address in our browser. The services on the Vic appliance will take several minutes to start. Refresh this page periodically to check. Since we used a self-signed TLS certificate, a certificate error will appear. This will also appear when using certificates auto-generated by the Vic appliance. Add the root CA certificate to your operating system to eliminate these warnings. As we can see, the appliance is using the certificate that we provided during deployment. Once appliance services are started, we can initialize the appliance through this modal on the Getting Started page. Enter the vCenter server location, administrator credentials, and if using an external PSC, provide those details as well. When a green bar is displayed at the top of the Getting Started page, the appliance is successfully initialized. If a red bar is displayed, appliance initialization has failed. If the page is refreshed, the red bar will go away, but the appliance remains uninitialized. On the Getting Started page, there is a link to the VIC documentation. You may also download the files needed to deploy a VCH, contained in the vSphere Integrated Containers Engine bundle. Finally, we have a link to the Container Management Portal. We can check that the appliance is functioning by viewing the Container Management Portal. After logging in, we can see that the Management Portal is running, but this is a fresh install, so there isn't anything populated yet. I will review some of the things that you can do in the Management Portal. We can see that this screen is where you can create a project within the Management Portal. Under Registries, by default, Docker Hub and the registry running on the appliance are added. Under Configuration, you can download the registry root certificate. This is needed by Docker clients to be able to connect to the registry if using auto-generated self-signed certificates. Under Identity Management, Users and Groups, you can manage users' roles and see the default users that were created during deployment. When we later have a virtual container host deployed, we can add that here. This will enable us to deploy containers to that VCH through the container screen. On the container screen, we can deploy containers by specifying the container image, container name, and the command to run. Thanks for watching, and you can find out more about vSphere integrated containers at github.com/vmware/vic-product.